Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward. By Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. By Tandem Diabetes Care, makers of the T-Slim X2 insulin pump. And by Real Good Foods, real food you feel good about eating. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Welcome back to another episode of the show. So glad to have you along. I am your host, Stacey Sims, and something a little different this week. As you're listening, I'm just back from the Friends for Life conference. It's a wildly busy time. I'm probably catching up on sleep at this moment. I may not have a voice, but you know, I don't want to skip a week of the show. So here's what I'm doing. This is what I'm calling a classic episode where we reach back into the archives to revisit a great guest from a previous show. With so many episodes now, more than 230 over the four years we've been doing this show, you know, maybe you're newer to the show. Maybe you haven't heard everything. Maybe you missed one along the way. We do, by the way, have a great search feature on the website over at diabetes-connections.com. You know, I'd urge you to use that for whatever you're interested in. Um, you just type in a couple of keywords or you can scroll through the archives, which, as I said, are pretty extensive at this point. But today you're going to hear from Richard Vaughn, truly one of my favorite guests and one of my favorite people in the diabetes community. He is a treasure to our community. He was diagnosed as a kid in the 1940s. Now, I spoke with him, it is almost four years ago now, and at that time, he was marking 70 years with type 1 diabetes. Yeah, 7 zero. Now, Richard is still doing a lot of writing. You've probably seen his posts if you're in certain Facebook groups, and I will link up his Facebook page and other ways to find him. He has a book as well. So here is my interview, which originally aired September of 2015 with Richard Vaughn. Let's start at the beginning. You were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 1945, 70 years ago. Do you remember anything about that diagnosis? You were six years old, right? That's correct. I had been to three doctors who could not diagnose me, and it took a fourth doctor to recognize the symptoms. I guess they just didn't know much about diabetes back then. And even he wasn't considering getting me started on insulin. He had to refer me to a fifth doctor who knew more about it. And uh, finally, I got things underway. But I was in very bad shape before I did finally receive some insulin. When you did, were you at a major hospital? It wasn't at a doctor's office, I assume. Oh, no. I was at a hospital. It was a very small one in the Roanoke, Virginia area. How long did you stay in the hospital? That I don't remember. Uh, I can't answer that. Maybe a few days, but uh, uh, they started me on the insulin, the animal insulin, Mm. and uh, I had lost a lot of weight, and I recovered very fast. Uh, That insulin did the job, and uh, I was in good shape uh, by the time I was, uh, well, better shape by the time I went home. And I didn't have any trouble walking. I was able to uh, get along, get around the rooms in the house without uh, without any problem. Had that been a problem? Had walking been a problem? Yeah, uh, I was so weak. I had lost a lot of weight, and I, I wasn't eating. I wasn't eating because uh, I guess that is in the more advanced stages of the development of type one diabetes. I've read about other people who who do not have any uh, urge to eat. They have lost their appetite. So the doctor sent you home with this relatively new medicine, this insulin. And what instruction did they give your parents? What did you have to do day to day? I was supposed to totally avoid sugar or any food containing sugar, but there were no other instructions about diet, which means that I ate lots of things that I shouldn't have been eating. I was eating the white bread and the potatoes and the rice and all that kind of thing. But uh, we thought that was perfectly all right because it didn't have sugar. Wow. Right. It wasn't a sweet. It was a carbohydrate. They didn't think about that. That's right. Well, he never mentioned carbohydrates. And it was a very long time after that that I had a doctor that did. 
at that time, too, how did you test? How did you administer insulin? Take us through some of that. Tested my urine in the morning, but no other time until the next morning. And based on the outcome of the urine test, I was able to determine a dosage. Of course, my parents were doing it at first. And uh, just everything just resolved around that one urine test and in the morning and the one injection. It's a 20 uh, animal insulins are 24 hour insulins. And uh, and I had to to make do with all of that and no information about carbs. And for some miraculous reason, I I thrived on that. Uh, The animal insulins must have been quite good, actually, Uh, and eating the wrong way. But one thing people have told me, I, I lived on a little farm and I, w- I wasn't eating food from the grocery stores much at all. We had our own orchard. We had uh, our own garden. We had our own uh, meat from animals on our farm and uh, eggs and from our chickens. And we churned milk the old fashioned wow. way. We had uh, we had milk and butter, and my mother even made cottage cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so you ate natural foods. You didn't eat a lot of processed foods, and that had to have helped. Yes, I think that had a lot to do with my doing so well for so long. At your presentation at Friends for Life, which was fantastic, by the way, you showed some pictures, and I, I want to talk about that as we go through your story, but you talked about the needles and the differences. Would you mm-hmm. mind talking a little bit about how you administered insulin at that time? The needle was longer than the ones on the disposable needles uh, syringes that we use now. I think it was probably almost three quarters of an inch long. Hmm. My legs were very skinny because I had lost all that weight when I started injecting, and I could not push that much of a needle into the top of my leg in the muscle, which is where I was instructed to inject, I probably would have struck bone. (laughs) So I guess we pushed maybe half of the needle. As I gained weight, I could push more of the needle in. That's what the doctor wanted. They wanted you to inject it in the muscle. Yes. Um, Insulin acts faster in muscle. Now in this day and time, we use uh, fatty tissue. But uh, we have faster acting insulins now than what I was using. So to compensate for that, the muscle was the best way to do it. This routine that you were given at the age of six, did it pretty much stay the same for a long time in terms of testing urine in the morning, one shot a day with that big painful needle into the muscle? Did it stay that way for a long time? It did for many years. Uh, I think I was probably out of high school before anything changed. And even then, I was still testing urine in the morning, but I had the disposable syringes, the shorter needle, and improvements in the animal insulin, still animal insulin until the mid-1990s. So that was 45 years, or closer to 50 years, that I was on the animal insulins. But the insulins did improve. They did things to improve the animal insulins, and so things got better, but very gradually. And forgive my ignorance, but during that time, was your doctor doing things like an A1C test? Uh, There were no home blood sugar meters, but did your doctor's office have different technology? A1C tests were invented, so to speak, in 1976. Hmm. And I had moved to uh, New York by then, and my internal medicine doctor, who was taking care of my diabetes starting in 1977, started me on A1Cs. I think my first one was actually in 1980. And uh, my first few A1C numbers were like 12 and 13 and 11.5. I remember those three specifically. And it stayed that way for quite some time. 11.5 is the number that my son was diagnosed at. When he was twenty, uh-huh. when he was twenty-three months old, um, mm-hmm. and so of course we wanted to bring him down from that. But that's what I thought of when you said eleven point five. But for someone like yourself who'd been, you testing once a day with with urine, and I can't imagine that was considered something horrible. But when you started thinking about those kinds of tests, did your doctor talk to you about bringing it down, or was it just accepted as okay? That's the number for now. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Something I would like to mention, though, animal insulins contain. C peptide. Mm. Humans have C peptide. If they produce insulin, they produce C peptide, and that that substance uh, helps protect against complications. 
Now, animals also producing their own insulin, and they produce C-peptide. Now, I was receiving that C-peptide every time I took a shot of animal insulin, and that is also a theory that many uh, of us long-termers subscribe to. We think that that helped us avoid the complications in our early years. That's so interesting. Now, during that time, we kind of skipped ahead. You got married. You had children in the 1960s. Do you mind? I, I'm not sure if this is appropriate to ask, but when you got married, was diabetes something that you and your wife talked about? In other words, hey, it's a package deal. You get me. You get this crazy stuff along for the ride, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, we talked about it while we were dating. And uh, she really didn't know anything about it, and uh, her parents didn't seem to either. So it wasn't something, uh, oh, no, you have diabetes. Uh, she wasn't scared of it because she didn't know anything about it. And so she just learned gradually as we were dating, and uh, uh, I wasn't having lows. I was ha I was probably running. I wasn't being able to test my blood sugar back then, but I, I imagine I was running highs pretty consistently. So she didn't see me behaving very differently from someone who didn't have diabetes. After we got married in 1964, I, I don't know exactly what it was that was causing it, but I was having some lows, and occasionally she would have to wake me up during the night if I was thrashing around in bed and uh, I wasn't testing my blood sugar, but just from the way I felt, I, I knew I was low, and uh, she would give me, there were no glucose tablets back then, she would give me sugar and a little bit of water, stir it up, and uh, I would drink that, and that's the way she treated me. That's remarkable. Then, I'm thinking ahead decade by decade here, we talked about the 70s having the A1C test. The 80s, that seems to be a time when people thought about diet a little bit more, maybe mm -hmm. counting carbs or at least recognizing carbs. I remember from your talk, was that when you started thinking more about carbohydrates? I, I read about, in a magazine, I uh, read about carbohydrates and diabetes, didn't know they were even uh, associated with each other. I went to my internal medicine doctor, same doctor I mentioned earlier, and ask him about it, and he looked at me puzzled. He said, you don't know about carbs? <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't mentioned it. He is, I guess he assumed that I knew about it, that some other doctor had told me about that, it. Doesn't that happen a lot, too? <laughs> yeah, I know. And uh, so, yes, I started and uh, also found out that some carbs are more harmful than others. Some act fast and some don't. So I found out uh, which carbs I should be avoiding. And I wished at that time that I had avoided them uh, all my life. Um, but I was just grateful that I was in good shape and didn't have any complications. But, yes, I, I couldn't exactly start counting carbs because I didn't have the basal and bolus kinds of insulin. Right, yeah. But avoiding the harmful carbs or eating very small portions of them uh, did help. And I saw my... A1C is dropping down a bit. I was maybe down in the two the nines or the, the high eights uh, by that time. That's pretty significant. When did you start testing blood sugar at home? With your, with, I mean, with a finger prick, with a regular meter that we think of now. Mm -hmm. I walked into a drugstore one day and saw this funny looking instrument. And I asked my uh, pharmacist what that was. And he told me that that was for testing blood sugar the first I had heard of one. Took it home and tested and I was up in the 200s and I tested uh, frequently uh, and I was in the high 100s or the low 200s consistently. Before and you that, go on, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to ask you, Richard, what did you think when your pharmacist told you what that was? Did you believe it? <laughs> uh, yes, I did. I mean, some of the instructions on the package uh, indicated that uh, that's what it was. I, I, just, I didn't believe it when I read it, but when he confirmed it, I immediately bought it and took it home. I, I don't think it was even very expensive. It was an AccuCheck. AccuCheck was one of the companies that had meters way back then. And uh, it scared me, though, and it made me angry that I, that I had not been able to test up until that time and that I may have had much better control if I had had a blood sugar meter. So I had to really work hard 
and learn how to get those highs down into reasonable territory. And I felt low when I was in the mid 100s. My body was so used to being running high that the mid 100s actually made me feel like 130 or 140. I would feel low at that level. Did you get used to that difference eventually, or do you just live with feeling low when you're in range? Very gradually. I I did adjust, and uh, since I was adjusting my carbs and the kinds of things I ate, uh, it was coming down anyway. And uh, I began having A1Cs that were still lower. I think I eventually reached the sevens uh, by 1990. That's remarkable. And when did you switch to the faster-acting insulins that were available? That was the mid-1990s. That's when uh, my doctor put me on a mixed insulin. It was called a Humalog mix. And that was my first time using something other than animal insulins. And I had to adjust to that. And I was having a lot of lows. But then I started taking less insulin and that helped me, and then I started seeing, by the, by the turn of the century, I was seeing excellent A1Cs and uh, high fives and low sixes, and I've been pretty much at that level ever since. Do you feel markedly different at that A1C than you did? Do you recall maybe back in the 70s or 80s at the higher A1C how you felt? I felt good. I felt good at the higher levels. My body adjusted to that, and it seemed to be my norm. And I didn't have any complications. So I actually believe that running high all those years did no harm to me. That's remarkable. Now I've been type 1 for 70 years, and I still don't have complications except for some minor nerve damage, a little bit of neuropathy, and that's it. So I've, I've been very lucky, and I don't think all those highs back then, it didn't make me feel bad. I was going to college for six years. Uh, I was teaching at the college level. Uh, and I, I just felt like I had a pretty much normal life. I didn't realize how abnormal it actually was until I started testing uh, testing with my meter in the 1990s. And you mentioned when you started testing that you felt angry. Do you still feel that way, or did that come and go? Well, if I had developed complications, I think I would still feel angry, but I didn't. So there's really no need to be angry, I suppose. I don't I don't think that any of my high blood sugar or anything else that was happening back then has done me any harm. It really is remarkable. I want to ask you, if I can, about the Joslin Medal and mm-hmm. the, the program. The Joslin Center um, up in uh, Massachusetts gives a medal for people who have lived very long with uh, type 1 diabetes. It's 50 years, right? Mm-hmm. That's correct. And it's also a, it's a medical study as well. Tell us a little bit about your enrollment in the Joslin uh, study. H- how did you find out about it? H- what kind of proof do you have to offer? What is it all about? When I applied for the 50-year medal and received it in the mail, there was a, a paragraph in the, uh, in the mail they sent me that urged me to participate. It wasn't required, of course. And I agreed. I liked the idea. I was eager to do that. That was the first I had heard of it. And uh, so they sent me a big package, many, many pages that they wanted me to fill out, telling me, telling them about my past, such details that they wanted uh, about my parents. Was there any other type one among my relatives? Uh, what was it like when I was growing up? What kind of food did I eat? And uh, also, so many different things about my past. And then currently, at the time that I was going to participate, uh, what had changed and uh, how did I eat then and how did I exercise? Uh, Just so many details, I can't even remember them all now. But there were pages and pages of that. And they wanted to know my A1Cs, all that they could get their hands on. So I asked my doctor if he could make out uh, a chart with my A1Cs, and he did so. He hand <laughs> he doesn't use a typewriter. <laughs> or a computer, and I take he, it. <laughs> he doesn't use a computer. He's an old-fashioned guy. He's <laughs> only one year younger than me. Love it. 
and uh, he did write it out and and uh, gave it to me, and I took it with me when I went there to to Jocelyn, and so they had a pretty thorough record of my A1Cs. To uh, a lot of the Jocelyn medalists didn't have the, as many A1Cs to provide as I did. When I participated, they had me do a glucose tolerance test. I had never had one. And I was supposed to to use my pump and do my basal insulin throughout the day, but I was not supposed to eat any breakfast, and I was not supposed to take any bolus before they gave me the glucose. It, nasty tasting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after they gave it to me, they tested my blood sugar every half hour for two hours. What they wanted to observe is would my blood sugar consistently rise or would it rise and then start falling? That would indicate whether I was producing any insulin or not. Some of the Jocelyn medalists were producing insulin. That's a fairly well-known fact now that many people with diabetes over 50 years are still producing some insulin. Not a significant amount. They are still insulin dependent. But uh, I was not because my blood sugar kept going up and up I was in the 300s by the end of uh, two hours, and I hadn't been at that high for so long. I was really sick. Uh, then I was allowed to bolus. It took me a long time to come down. I had to take a really big bolus. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I imagine, though, that a lot of the research they're doing is intended to help people live long with type 1 diabetes. I mean, to have that many people who have been living with diabetes for 50 years, 60, 75 years is remarkable. What is it like when you all get together occasionally? Uh, I have been able to attend only once. It, uh, I attended in 2011. There were about 100 medalists there that day. And I did not attend in 2013 or 2015 because I went to uh, to Florida to participate in the Friends for Life uh. Uh, conference instead. And they are the Jocelyn Medalist meeting and the Friends for Life meeting are in consecutive months. And um, they're both expensive. So I decided I would rather go to Friends for Life. I get a lot more out of that, actually. I don't want to derail the conversation, but what what do you get out of Friends for Life that's more? Is it the family? Well, I, I started on uh, online in 2006 meeting type ones and discussing things with them and um, I became friends with them and by going to friends for life especially with all the, the friends I've made on Facebook I got to meet them and that was that was uh, thrilling <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed meeting these people I hadn't seen anything about their picture and uh, that was good and oh there's so many uh so many talks at Friends for Life about uh, new devices that are being created. I enjoyed the talk this year about the bionic pancreas, and uh, apparently they're going to try to have it ready in another couple of years, and people will be using it. I think that's very exciting. And uh, there are just so many different talks, information that I can find out about and learn about and participate in, uh, that I don't necessarily get online. So it's, it's new material and making new friends and meeting old friends. Uh, I just think that's, that's wonderful. That is fantastic. Now, I have to share that I saw on Facebook that as you spoke this year, you were nervous about presenting. You were kind of concerned, it seemed, that no one would be interested in your story. Do you feel better about it now? You got a great response. Uh, yes, I, I, I do. I did not expect uh, maybe more than a dozen people to show up. I think there were at maybe around thirty or so, and uh, that and some of some of the people there were noteworthy people, like David Edelman, who created DiabetesDaily.com, and uh, some other people who uh, know a lot about uh, diabetes and uh, noteworthy people. I was pleased that they were in my audience. I felt comfortable after I got started. People were laughing at my at my nonsense. 
and uh, they liked my pictures. Oh, and, and what thrilled me most was that they had lots of questions. I had a totally different program in mind when we started. I had lots of notes, things that I had pulled off the computer and out of my past and what have you, and I didn't get to any of that because people were obviously enjoying the questions and the answers. I just stuck to that for the entire period, and uh, maybe if I talk there again, I'll have a totally different program. <laughs> I hope you talk again, because I was there, and I, I got to see much of your talk. I had to, unfortunately, we didn't get to meet in person. I had to run out for a moment, but... Um, it was it was very educational to see how you can thrive even with what many of us would call you know the bad old days of diabetes without this technology that we all rely on now. Yes. But you really can thrive if you're if you're careful. But you know we skipped ahead, Richard. You mentioned your insulin pump when we were talking about the Joslyn medalists. When did you get an insulin pump, and why did you decide to get one? Uh, I had good A one Cs before. But so many people on Diabetes Daily told me that uh, I would have even better control, that I would have, I wouldn't have as many highs and lows. You can you can have a good A1C even though you have a lot of highs and lows because the highs and the lows tend to average out, and uh, that's what was happening to me. But I was having occasional numbers in the very high 100s, and occasional numbers in the 40s or even the high 30s, but uh, take for instance a number like 30 and a number like 170. You take those and add them together and divide by two. It's the average is 100. Yeah, it looks good. So, uh, so I was having good A1Cs, but I did not have the precise control that I wanted, and uh, I was assured that if I used the pump, things would change, and it did. I started having fewer lows and fewer highs, and my A1Cs really weren't changed. They were pretty much the same, uh, but my control was better. Do you have any advice for parents like me? Uh, my son has been living with type 1 for eight years. He's 10 years old now. I think we're doing pretty well, but boy, would I like him to get your attitude and share some of, uh, if you could share some of your wisdom. I have joined a lot of uh, parents groups online, and I post there occasionally. And uh, a lot of the parents do go to my Facebook page and read blogs and what have you that I've written. So I've made friends with a lot of them. And uh, I advise them. Some of them write, give me uh, private messages on Facebook and, and ask me things concerning their own children. My advice to parents, especially those who have a recently diagnosed child, is to educate themselves, the children may be too young at that stage, educate themselves by joining these groups and uh, use their computer browser and look up things and and be sure that the source of the information is reliable. Uh, get that education, buy books uh, that involved diabetes type 1 in particular, and there are a number of really really good ones out there. And uh, ask for advice, not from me, but from other parents who have children who are having the same problems. And I think that's the best way to proceed. And uh, um, a lot of parents have, have told me that that is exactly what they're doing, and it has worked very well for them. And what about adults with type 1? Any advice for people who are living this and taking care of themselves, but maybe just getting frustrated and tired of it day to day? Oh, uh, that's, a, that's something I have been always so concerned about. There are a lot of people with type 1 who are in denial. They don't take care of themselves. And occasionally one of them will pop in and, and admit that and say, I haven't been really taking care of myself for the past 15 years, and my blood sugars are running high. I am now experiencing retinopathy, uh, damage in my eyes. I have terrible pain in my feet from neuropathy. Uh, My kidneys are not good. I'm finally wanting to take care of myself. Is it too late? What can I do? What do you say? That is a situation that, I have a lot of difficulty with, and so do the other people who 
who reply. Yeah. So what I usually say is that uh, it is usually not too late to turn things around if you can gradually use your meter and test many times per day, keep your uh, blood sugars under much better control, get your A1C down from whatever it is down to seven or less if possible, then you might find that your complications are improving. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is almost always what will happen. But there are some people who have been in bad shape for so long, it's like it's almost too late. And they may have really bad situations occurring. Richard, you are retired. You and your wife have celebrated 51 years of marriage. You have grandchildren. What do you do for fun? What's life like now? Well, other than spending a lot of time on the computer with my (laughs) friends and and going to conferences, I do a lot of construction. I have become a sort of a a carpenter of sorts. I I have work on my home. We bought a, a fixer upper home in 1970 here in New York, and I've, I do a lot of work on my house, uh, climbing ladders and painting. I think I'll have to stop that, though, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I, that's a lot of exercise. Oh, I, I, I love exercise. Today, I went to the gym for an hour, worked with exercise machines. Tomorrow, I'm going to take an hour walk on hills in my local area. I, I believe in getting two really good hours of exercise per day. And um, working on the house is is part of that. And and that helps a lot, of course. It sure does. That's terrific. Before I let you go, I have to tell you a quick story, um, if you'll indulge me. When my son was younger, I want to say he was about five or six years old. So he'd been checking and, and doing the diabetes routine at that point for for four years, probably. He came home from a day camp. It was a regular day camp, not a diabetes camp. And said another little boy had told him that if he poked his fingers too many times, he could bleed to death, right? He could die from poking his fingers. So I took a deep breath because I wasn't quite sure how to respond to that. But I had just seen a video that Carrie Sparling at the Six Until Me blog had posted about the Joslin medalists. And I was able to show my son that not only are there people living with diabetes for 50 years or more, but that checking their blood sugar and poking their finger helped them get there. And he said at that time, you know, I bet they've tested a thousand times. And we laughed because, of course, it's much more than that. But I just can't thank the Jocelyn Medalist program and the people in it enough for that one tiny conversation that really helped my family. So I know it's really important research that you're all doing. But thank you so much for letting me use you like that. I appreciate it. I enjoyed this. Richard, thank you so much for joining me today. You are such an inspiration, not only with how you've lived so long with diabetes, but how you continue to share your story. So please stay on the computer and keep going to those conferences. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. I'll link up more information about Richard. His book, his writings, the Jocelyn Medalist group that he referenced there. Isn't that amazing? Gosh, what a story. Can you imagine with the tools that they did not have? It really is uh, incredible to listen to him talk about, you know, we think about the olden days in diabetes as before CGM. Yeah, I mean, he puts that all in perspective. Okay, so next week, actually, it's a good segue here. Next week, we're going to talk all about prevention of type 1 diabetes. We talked a couple of episodes ago about the big new study from TrialNet where they showed that they could prevent the onset of type 1 diabetes by up to two years. And you might have thought to yourself, well, big deal. You know, what does that really mean for me? It's a huge deal. And we're going to talk to the folks from TrialNet about why it's such a big deal, why type 1 is so difficult to pin down in terms of prevention and, you know, one day a cure and lots of other interesting prevention studies that are going on. So this was a great one. You know, I, I catch myself saying that all the time, but if I didn't think they were great. Why would I be doing that, right? Why would I be talking to people about this stuff? I, I never want to put out an episode that I don't think is great. Thank you to my editor, to John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Really appreciate him, especially during these times when we're time shifting and traveling and crazy things are going on. So John, hats off to you. Thank you. I appreciate you. 
And thanks to you as you listen. I hope you can tell that doing this show is a great honor for me and and truly the most rewarding professional project I've ever had. I can't wait to record a new show every week. And I hope that never goes away. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.